Today, we're living in a very different times. Just part of the, of the fact that just 24 days ago, the 46th president and vice president was sworn into the highest office in the United States, that an attack was leveled against not just the US Capitol, but against the bedrock of our democracy as a nation. We're also seeing precious souls searching for something to belong to, someone of like-mindedness to connect with. They are looking for ideas and actions to relate to that support their values and beliefs. We saw a lot of that on the Capitol. We saw it during the summertime uh, last year. Um, they are looking for ideas and actions to relate to that, they're, that support their values and belief. We have also seen unprecedented division in our country. Uh, it's inter interesting that now it's this month is Black History Month. Uh, and if you've seen some of the documentaries and you saw the division back in the 50s and the 60s, the 70s, and well, not so much the 70s, toward the end of the 60s, because uh, that was when the, um, the what you call re revolution came in uh, to our country. But we are seeing the same type of division now based upon race. We have also, uh, excuse me, why now if you support a certain candidate, it's being discussed as to how to deprogram you. So the, to deprogram you from your beliefs, your values. You know, it's amazing to hear uh, that even in our highest office in Congress, uh, our representatives are talking about how can we go and deprogram someone because they believed uh, on a, someone else's ideology. Uh, is, that's very interesting. We had uh, terrorism in our country. We've had uh, domestic threats in our country. I, I don't ever remember hearing that, but now we're at a point where our government is looking at how do we deprogram those who believe someone else's ideology which is very interesting, very interesting. Let me continue on. We have and are seeing one of the most effective tools of the enemy's arsenal. Does anyone know what that is? Racism. Being used as a battering ram to separate people. In fact, it would appear that this nation is no longer looking like the home of the free and the brave, but some, but the home of curtailing our liberties, and perhaps we are seeing an ideology, because this is what it really boils down to, that looks strangely like totalitarianism. I'm not going to get into that word right now, but maybe I'll come back to it. It's harder to have a friendly conversation with people, if you've noticed, you know, because if you can engage someone in a conversation where we're being conditioned to be very careful about who we talk to, who do we interact with, uh, especially of our own neighbors and neighborhood uh, is very interesting. Um, everyone now has the potential of having the coronavirus. And, and yes, that's true, that's very true. But the possibility of carrying an unknown or a known virus didn't start in December, 2019. And we were still engaged with communicating with people, talking, speaking to people at the grocery stores at the gas station. That situation actually uh, has been a part of our life since sin has entered the world back way back in the Garden of Eden. And let me say for the record, I am not saying the virus is not serious. The coronavirus is not a serious threat. It absolutely is, especially for those individuals who have a compromised immune system. We know that to be the case. That's very true and will not uh, discredit that. But I wanted to share something with you. I, I, I have this app, I always pay attention to it. I look at you know the number of cases in this country. It has uh, it has the cases being reported for every country in the world, every country. So let me just let's look at America right now. So right now in this country we have two hundred twenty eight million one hundred and eleven eight hundred and ninety nine confirmed cases of the virus. This is not going to be a social discussion. I I, I promise you. We have um, 400 to date, 492,663 precious souls who have died from the virus. We also know that we have 
42,270 individuals have recovered from the virus. Was that because of the vaccine? No, it wasn't. So in actual fact, in the United States of America, we have 9,576,966 active cases of reported coronavirus, not 28,111 uh, confirmed cases. So let me share my screen, if I may. And I, I shared that for a reason. I think we all can want to hear the truth. We all want to be a part of the truth. And let's see. So we'll start out again. My title and topic today is What God Do You Serve? And the Folly of Idolatry. I'm going to reread the um, opening uh, scripture again, and you can read along with me. And it's again out of Deuteronomy chapter four, verse 30, and it says, when thou art in trouble, are in tribulation, and all these things are come upon thee, even in the latter days, are we in the latter days? Um, we are certainly in the latter days. If thou turn to the Lord thy God and shall be obedient to his voice, for the Lord thy God is a merciful God, he will not forsake thee, neither destroy thee, nor forget the covenant of thy fathers, which he swore unto them. We are told in God's word that in times of tribulation, in the last days, if we're obedient, that's the key, if we're obedient uh, and we listen, if we surrender, uh, to him, to his voice, he will not forsake us. You know, we are so very thankful and blessed to have God's word before us that uh, we've been reading in the great controversy on how the Bible came into existence, especially back in Europe uh, with our early, our early, our early um, uh, reformers and what they went through to have this word. And can you imagine having to write this thing by hand some individuals could not afford it, obviously, and they uh, poor, they maybe bought a portion of the Bible or for the very uh, rich, they actually bought the whole Bible, but it was a very painstaking process until the printing press was brought into existence. So we're very fortunate to have the word of truth before us in our homes of, available everywhere. And again, during the dark ages, individuals die just to have a, a verse of scripture. So we're very blessed. And that's why we should never take it for, for granted. And we definitely should be holding on to it. I heard a story last night uh, during our Bible study that someone said that, um, and this is not just Seventh-day Adventists, these are Christians all over the world. They're saying that over 90% of Americans have started looking into their Bible because of what has happened with this virus, this uh, pandemic. Uh, and they're looking for answers. Again, they're looking for answers. Um, let's turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse three and four. And let's read what that says. 2 Corinthians chapter three, verse four. <laughs> And I, I, I don't have it on the uh, screen, so I want us to use our Bibles as we go through this, this study. And it reads, and, I, and, and at the, in my Bible, the title says, The Subtility of False Apostles, 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, verse, uh, 3 and 4, and it reads, and I'm going to read in the Greek words uh, for certain words inside of the scripture. It says, but I fear lest by any means as a serpent beguiled in the Greek, that's uh, uh, 1818, and it means deceive. We could probably agree that. Eve, though, uh, deceive, excuse me, but, but I fear also lest by any means as a serpent beguiled, deceive, Eve through his subtility, uh, subtility means false wisdom, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. For if he that cometh preacheth another uh, Jesus whom we have not preached, or if ye receive another spirit 
In the Greek, spirit is pneuma, and it means the Holy Spirit, but it also means an evil spirit, which we have not received, or another gospel which ye have not accepted, ye might well bear with him. So what has this to do with today's message? Has not God's word told us these are signs of the last days? There will be worldwide famine, pestilence, wars, rumors of wars, earthquakes in diverse places. And I want to pause there because, you know, because of the virus and because of all these other distractions, and they are distractions, we are missing what's going on around the rest of this globe. There are, and, and I, some may have seen this before. I remember I spoke about it several months ago, but I mean, if you start looking at the pestilence, the disasters, the earthquakes, the hurricanes in rapid succession, succession, and we're told in the word of truth that these things will become more and more frequent, like a woman that's in travailing uh, in birth, that they're going to continue to come. They're going to continue to come. And the Lord says, in both Matthew 24 and Luke 21, these are the beginning of sorrows. And are we ready for that? Are we ready to stand firm regardless the pressure that we're going to be put up under? Are we seeing this today? I guarantee you we're seeing it today. If this be true, and we can verify it from the Bible, prophecy, and the trends or models we're seeing today, shouldn't we share with others who is the true God that we serve, the God who has all the answers? Shouldn't we wisely and I say wisely, we have to be very wise of how we share. There are some things that we can share with some groups and some we can't share with others. But by God's grace, he has given us his word. He's given us the spirit of prophecy that we have ample books to share, tracks that will help others. And also, also, Aren't we witnesses within ourselves, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we speak with one another, the way we dress, the way we eat, the way we love one another? Isn't that a distinguishing character that the Lord said to his disciples that all men will know that ye are my disciples if you have love one to another? It is time to practice that love and believe in it. Let's move on to the next uh, session. And I got to tell you, I am not picking up on anyone in this entire presentation. So don't take it that way. I am just bringing to the forefront of which God do we serve. Now, you could read the slide. I want to read my notes. On January 3rd, 2021, the 117th session of Congress opened, opening prayer given by Representative Missouri Representative Emanuel Cleaver, who ended his prayer, I quote, we ask it in the name of the monotheistic God, Brahma, and God known by many names, by many different faiths, a man and a woman. Just as startling, uh, Representative Cleaver is a pastor with United Methodists from Kansas City. One would believe he would know of the true God and would not dare try to appease the false gods of culture and correctness for political gain. Cleaver said he considered the ending a lighthearted pun. He's in prayer. A lighthearted pun explaining that it was his intention to recognize the record number of women now serving in Congress. And the new female chaplain of the house Cleaver said he finds the changes to be blessings from God, for which he is grateful. But I got to ask you the question. I could be wrong. But isn't prayer a sacred blessing and opportunity to speak with the creator? Are we told that as we pray in sincerity, sincerely, opening up our hearts to the Lord, we are lifted to heaven, but not to humor our heavenly father, or the heavenly host, wouldn't that mean that every sincere, humble, contrite heart praying, that prayer is sacred? Because doesn't the Bible tells us that the Holy Spirit takes those prayer requests 
and fixes them up, gives, sending them to the Father so that he can bless them as sweet-smelling Savior? That's what the Bible says. Now, moving on. Now, Pope Francis, during a mass at St. Basilica's, calls coronavirus vaccination an ethical obligation. And again, my title, which God do you serve? Now I want to define the definition of, definition of, of uh, ethical. And it says in the, in the dictionary, ethical, number one, is relating to a moral principles or the branch of knowledge dealing with these. The second, of a medicine legally available only in a doctor's prescription and usually not advertised to the general public. Now, again, I'm not saying the coronavirus is, uh, is not worth addressing, should we do something about it? But when you use the term uh, ethical responsibility, moral principles, principles being encouraged by what Daniel 7 and, uh, verse 8 and Daniel 8 verse uh, 9 calls the little horn power that not only persecuted God's people, but still works to recognize, to be recognized as the moral authority in the world. Yes, God's word says that the entire world will wonder or follow after the beast. That's out of Revelation chapter 13 verse 3 and Revelation 7, 7 verses 8. And now the beast is flexing his moral authority. Has anyone seen that? H have you been hearing that? The world is falling in lockstep motion to her degrees. And it's amazing that nothing, let me rephrase that. Let me rephrase that. We are seeing the, move, the rapid sensation of joining together with the papacy in so many ventures in our country. And truthfully, they already say America is a Catholic America, no longer Protestant. That should make us wake up. Beloved, we're told in the Bible that soon destruction is coming upon thousands of cities in the world. And every city is to be visited by the divine ju judgments of sin just before the coming of the Lord. So let's read that out of Revelation chapter 16, verse 19. And it reads, and the great city was divided into three, into three parts of the, uh, and excuse me, in three parts. And the cities of the nations fell, and great Babylon came in remembrance before God to give unto her her cup of the wine of the fierceness of her wrath. I know as we see this wonderful cold white day may be hard to imagine or maybe we have more time, but there's coming a time when this is going to come true. You know, no, no matter what men may say or women may say, the Bible prophecies cannot be broken. They cannot be broken. You cannot wish them away. You cannot bury yourself in them. Whether we are alive or whether we're buried, resting on the Lord, these trials are coming. They're coming. We're told in the word of truth that those that will be sheltered from these divine judgments are those that receive the seal of the living God. Revelation chapter seven, verses one through three and Ezekiel chapter nine, verses one through 10. So we actually, as we should know, and I believe we all know that we need to surrender. Surrender self, re surrender yeah, pride. We need to surrender everything to the Lord and isn't that the goal that, you know, we have read in the spirit of prophecy that we should try, we should work, we should endeavor to be among the 144,000. We absolutely should. But I got to tell you, brothers and sisters, beloved, it's time to let loose of this world, let loose of this sin sick filled world, because it is truly spiraling out of control. Uh, and there's so much I want to say, but I don't have that, that time because of time's sake, so I'm going to continue to move on. Now, 
I thought this was a very interesting article. Uh, and it has two words that can never, never go together before the old, what we used to say, they are uh, oxymorons. This is an oxymoron. Oh, before I get to that, let me just show you some scenes from what happened. Uh, and this isn't for theater, is not to um, do anything but to show these individuals who were on the Capitol as they were making their voices known and their decisions. You see the American flag there, you see the Trump flag there, and then you see the uh, Congress men and women cowering in fear of their lives. We see them intimidating the Capitol Hill police and all the law enforcement officials that were there. And I, and I gotta tell you, I'm gonna come back to this, please remember these shots, but I gotta tell you, this is what we call that, um, the crowd mentality, right? We, this is a crowd, these people came and some people was involved in this and said, I don't know what happened, that wasn't my plan. I was just, you know, just gonna demonstrate, but I didn't know it was gonna go to this level, but we're told about this before and I'm gonna to come to it in just a second. And I wonder, in fact, I'm gonna go back to the Exodus. Yeah, it has a very interesting connotation. And we're gonna read out of Idolatry at Sinai. This is out of Patriarchs and Prophets. And it reads, and please listen closely. In the absence of Moses, the judicial authority had been delegated to Aaron and a vast crowd gathered about his tent and the demand, make us gods, which will go before us for as for this Moses, the man that brought us up out of the land of Egypt, we want not what is become of him. So I'm gonna ask at this point with the Hebrews and the mixed multitude, they saw Mount Sinai. They saw the cloud around the mount. They heard the voice. It's amazing when you read this in Ezekiel. I think it's chapter 19. Yes, it is. When you read the, I mean, incredible scene at that time, but to come and to tell Aaron to make us gods, and you have the God of all creation and on at the mount, it's amazing. I'm going to continue reading. The cloud, they said, that heretofore led them now rested permanently upon the mount. It would no longer direct their travels because remember it brought them out of uh, Egypt and brought them into this location close to Mount Sinai where Moses was going to speak to his people. And he did so much so that they said, Moses, you speak to us, but as for God, please don't have him speak to us because they were quaking bawling on their faces, the right thing to do. It's amazing how quickly we've changed, but I'm getting to my point. They must have an image in its place. And if as had been suggested, they should decide to return to Egypt. Hmm. They would find favor with the Egyptians by burying this image before them and acknowledging it as their God, Patriarchs and Prophet, page 316, point, uh, paragraph one. And I'm reading paragraph two. Such a crisis demanded a man of firmness, decision, unflinching courage, one who held the honor of God above popular favor, personal safety, or life itself. And these tragic words, but the present leader of Israel was not of this character. And they're talking about Aaron. Here it is. Aaron feebly remonstrated, uh, with the people. That means that he he tried to say, no, 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 we can't do this great sin against our Lord. But then the prophet says, but his wavering timidity at the critical moment only rendered them the more determined. The torment increased. A blind, unreasoning frenzy seemed to take possession of the multitude. Now, I showed you the photographs. This is just, and you've seen many of them. And maybe some of this stuff is not new. But maybe for some, it is, because when we see people coming together in a multitude, 
to do what they did, who was in charge of that multitude? Who was in charge of that multitude? And I'm gonna come back to that oxymoron statement I just made. Reading on, there were some who remained true to their covenant with God, but the greater part of the people joined in the apostasy, a few who ventured to denounce the proposed image making as idolatry. You had some people said, no, we can't do this. Were set upon and roughly treated and in the confusion and excitement, they finally lost their lives. Have mercy, have mercy. All I could say is we've been uh, admonished that when the crowd is going one direction, we should go the other direction. That's just, we have to, because you, there's no safety in the crowd. The crowd gets revved up by evil spirits, Satan himself. Now, I wanna read out of Revelation chapter seven, verses one through three. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. So as we're approaching this world's end, there will be only two groups in the world. Those who serve God and receive his seal, those who believe God and believe his word, and those who serve the beast and receive his mark, which we are told in God's word is the mark, which is of Antichrist. Revelation chapter 13, verses 4 and verse 8 and chapter uh, and verse 17, and I'm going to show those. Now, how do we share the truth with those who are willing to accept just about any error or any new idea just to return back to normal? Man, if we could reset. I mean, have you heard it? Man, they are saying that uh, uh, if we go back in time, let's skip over 2020. And I, I've said this before in, in some of our discussions, probably in the morning call, and I said, I was talking to some of the colleagues that I work with and I had said, you know, and they said the same thing. And I said, well, wonder if 2020 was a good year. Wonder if 2021 going forward is terrible, if it's gonna be terribly bad because we know the uh, UN, the United Nations 2030 plan has some startling changes for the world the global economy. Uh, let me continue on. I'm going to read uh, again those verses out of Revelation chapter 13. And it reads, and they, who are the they? Those who have received the mark of the beast. They worship the dragon, which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, saying, who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? Verse 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. And that's, that's, that is amazing. That is, can you imagine as we see some of the stuff that's going on today as uh, religious liberties uh, message for uh, next Friday and next Sabbath, the future is now. Those who are following this direction, can you imagine their names are not written in the book of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, the book of life? Verse 17, and that no man might buy or sell, said he that had the mark of the name of the beast or the number of his name. Brothers and sisters, we talk about outreach. We talk about uh, evangelism. You know, the Light Bearers Mission Church has to be busy. It has to share the truth. Now we understand some people will accept and some people will not, but that's not our business. Our business is to sow that seed and let the Holy Spirit water that soil that's in the heart. But we've got to get busy. Uh, I was listening to a program um, yesterday and Thursday and, and, and the speaker said, what are we waiting for? <laughs> what are we waiting for? I mean, what more do we have to see? 
Oh, all right. Let me go on. <laughs> Let me go on. So this is what I talked to you about, those two words that should never go together, the oxymoron. So this is called a Christian insurrection, a Christian insurrection. And we see these uh, brothers who were, they're, they're very passionate. They believe in what they're doing. They believe that the Lord, as it says, many of those who mob the Capitol on Wednesday claim to be enacting God's will. Let me read on. Some were participants of the Jericho March, a gathering of Christians to, to pray, march fast and rally for election integrity. After calling on God to save the Republic during uh, rallies at state capitol and in DC over the past two months, we saw this actually when we were down there in December and I believe November, uh, the marchers returned to Washington with, with flourish. On the National Mall, one man waved the flag of Israel above a sign begging passengers to say yes to Jesus. I quote, shout if you love Jesus, someone yelled and the crowd cheered. Then they said, shout if you love Trump. The crowd cheered louder. The crowd's name is drawn from the biblical story of Jericho, a city of false gods and corruption. The uh, March's website says, just as God's instruments, uh, excuse me, just as God instructed uh, Joshua to march around Jericho seven times with priests blowing trumpets Christians gathered in DC blowing the shofars, the ram's horn, typically used in Jewish worship to banish the darkness of election fraud and ensure that the wall of corruption tumbles. I was gonna make a statement. I'm not gonna make a statement because I was gonna say it's amazing how from time to time we pull Jewish customs back into our Christian customs, but the, 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 the law of God, especially the fourth commandment, we don't, worry about that because that was done away with but i'm not going to go there you go on the jericho march is evidence that donald trump has been elements of american christianity christian insurrection american christianity to his will and that many christians have obligingly remade their faith in his image i go back to what i mentioned earlier congress is looking at how can we make uh, plans and to deprogram those who uh, believe this way. Now it was a it was a terrible situation, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. But see, one thing that I'm glad that some people are now saying, and I, we have said it for years. I'm so thankful that it's come to the forefront. We know many, if not all, of these new laws, laws that are coming to fruition, or they're enacting they become those bills, really are targeting Seventh-day Adventists. They're targeting us, especially with these terrorism laws that they're having that they've made you know, in the last 10 years. They're targeting Seventh-day Adventists. Let me go on. That's a whole different other topic, but I'm not gonna go there. Now, has anyone heard about this? And, and it's amazing, I saw this Thursday, and I saw it on Friday during our study as well. And I was like, praise the Lord. It's, the Lord is waking people up. Now, this is Mr. Gates' new idea. Bill Gates is now best known as a philanthropist, not the guy who started Microsoft or was the avatar for everyone's annoyance with Windows 95. He's also known for wanting to save us from ourselves. Now, apparently, he wants to save us from the sun. Now I'm just reading the article. This article is at, out of uh, the Western Journal. This article is also in the um, in Forbes and it's also in the conversation, I believe it is. And it reads, however, while you may have been paying attention to his efforts on vaccination and lockdowns, you may not have noticed that one of Gates' most controversial causes just got a go ahead. He got some thumbs up, a project that would block out the sun. According to Reuters, a Harvard University project plans to test out a controversy, con controversial theory that global warming can be stopped by spraying particles into the atmosphere that would reflect the sun's rays. The project represents one of the most controversial aspects of what's known as geoengineering. The idea that to tackle issues like climate change, massive 
aspects of our ecosystem can be played with or changed. And I, again, last night looking at this, I was just amazed that the brother said, who created this earth? God did. And you believe that we can tamper with God's earth. And since it's his, he controls it. He knows every aspect of it. And he knows what he's going to allow to occur, but it's not going to allow to occur. He's showing us through the earthquakes, the natural disasters, the pestilence uh, that the Lord's coming. But for puny men, arrogant men, prideful men, and women to think that you have the audacity to interfere in the geoengineering of this planet is um, incredible. In the uh, other articles, it actually said that while this might actually work in somewhere like the Sahara, Sahara Desert, on other parts of the world, it will cause uh, alarming dis uh, disaster that they can't control. So you can't pick and choose what you want to do. Reading all, I'm almost finished, hang in there. The ideal is simple, spray a bunch of particles into the stratosphere and they will cool the planet by reflecting some of the sun's rays back into space. Scientists have already witnessed the principle in action. Now, I gotta tell you, when this stuff comes into play, they have already been working on this. When it comes to the news, it probably has already happened. Now I'd like to read out of uh, Testimonies, volume five, volume five uh, page 137, verse four. It reads, these are called Satan's agents, excuse me, agents of Satan. Satan uses men and women as agents to solicit, to sin and make attractive, to make it attractive, to make sin attractive. And that's true, we see it today. These agents he faithfully educates to so disguise sin that he can more successfully destroy souls and rob Christ of his glory. Satan is a very great enemy of God and man. So I would ask the question, why don't men understand this? He hates every human being born in God's image. Let me go on. He transforms himself through his agents into himself through his agents into angels of light. In scripture, he is called count this, a destroyer, an accuser of the brethren, a deceiver, a liar, a tormentor, and a murderer. Why would anyone want to have anything to do with this fallen angel? Satan has many in his employ, but is most successful when he can, pro can use profess, profess Christians for his satanic work. And the greater their influence, the more elevated their position. The more knowledge they profess of God and his service, the more successful can he use them. Whoever entices to sin is his agent. And I like that. I, I, I love what the prophet says. She tells it like it is. Uh, my mother used to call it tis, T-I-S. <laughs> I love that. That's true. And we are told to judge individuals because we don't know the heart but we can judge it by their fruit. I love that statement. Moving on. <sighs> to the person who believes and expects sinful man make this world better or to be the solution, more specifically to those who put their trust in a president or a pope, to lead mankind into a saving relationship with the creator of the universe, we read these words. And this has come out of Jeremiah uh, chapter 17, verse five. Thus saith the Lord, cursed be the man that trusteth, trusteth in man and maketh flesh his arm and whose heart departed from the Lord. Brothers and sisters, we're going, we're about to go through some very tempestuous times that no human being has ever experienced. And why is that? Well, the Bible tells us, because when judgment is poured out, when God's judgment is poured out, uh, before it was poured out with mercy, but in this final time, the future is now, prophecy is now. But in this final time, 
this will not be the case. For it will not be the case for those who refuse to get on board the ark, the ark of salvation. And this is our, this is our, this is our burden. We have to share this truth with others so they too may know what's going to happen. So I ask the question again. Well, what God do you serve? Is it the God that your parents worship on the other side of the Jordan in Egypt or the gods in Babylon or the God of creation? But let's read what Jeremiah says, Jeremiah 24, 14 and 15, a very familiar uh, verses of scripture. And I pray it's all of our uh, theme. I believe that I pray that this is what we believe in and we serve and share with others. Now, therefore, fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in truth. And put away the gods which your father served on the other side of the flood in Egypt and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, Choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. And I'd like to leave you with this last verse of scripture. It is coming back out of Jeremiah 17, verse 7. And it says, Blessed is the man that trusteth in the Lord and whose help the Lord is. And I pray we put all of our trust in the Lord. And trust means obedience. Trust means following his word. Trust means allowing the Holy Spirit, when he knocks on that heart, that heart saying, let me in. We need to clean up inside of here. We've got to clean up some stuff because I cannot dwell in an unclean temple. So we've got to let go of some things. We've got to let go of some things if we want to be a part of the work that the Lord wants us to be a part of before he returns. So is there one this afternoon who is ready to surrender? Um, they're all to the Lord. Is there one that wants to get on board the ark of safety before the storm, storm comes? It's coming. Brothers and sisters, it's coming. You know, and not one of us is ready. Not one of us is ready. Don't we see the storm clouds brewing around us in the actions of those who know not the Lord? I can tell you, I'm not ready. I, I, study and study and study. I'm not ready. And I know there are wonderful brothers and sisters who are just staunch Christians, but we're not ready for what's about to happen, to be betrayed on by family members, by friends, to be, you know, I heard this statement before, when it's one thing when we say somebody doesn't like you, a person doesn't like you, an, a, a, a colleague, a neighbor, a friend, for some reason or another, uh, you, you're not getting along. But it's a whole different aspect when the entire world does not like us. They hate us and blame us for what's going on because of the calamities that are going to be coming. Don't we hear and see the armaments of battle closing in on our positions? I do. If you want to learn more about the great I am, through Bible study, or if you would like to speak with someone about your situation, or needs, please put, place your contact information in the chat box and you can send it to the Bible worker that's on there. And please put in your telephone number, email address, some way that we can get a hold of you and contact you so that we can speak with you. And if you just wanna talk about situations going on in your, in your life, uh, you just need someone to talk to, please put your name inside of the chat box. And if someone is interested in learning more about the Lord, if someone wants Bible study, if someone wants to consider maybe even getting baptized, please put your name in the chat box. The reason the song was, are you ready for Jesus to come? Let us ponder that, brothers and sisters. Are we ready for Jesus to come? Do we reflect his 
beautiful image. Not the physical only. We're talking about in the heart. Do we reflect his image? Let us pray. Eternal Father, Father, I pray it is time for your people, for me, for us to share this truth, Father. We're seeing uh, that your word is moving. Uh, it will not return unto you void with people that are not of our faith, Father. They're taking it and they're sharing it. They're seeing it and they are putting up a bulwark to say that they're not going to follow after this. They're not going to follow the dictates of the enemy. Father, but what about us? Let us be wise in how we approach, but let us do something. Let us get busy as a, as a people, individually, in our households, in our communities, in our cities. Father, help us to be about your business. Motivate us, Father. And as I pray before with one of our brothers, I pray, Father, that you will light a fire in our backs that we just cannot be quiet, that we have to share the word, your word to others so that they know that a storm is coming and we want them to be ready. We want them to be saved. And as the prophet has said, there will be no uh, starless crowns in heaven. Everyone, everyone will have shared and labored and, 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 and prayed humbly to get someone into heaven. Let that be our burden this day, Holy Father. And we thank you for the Sabbath day, Father. And I pray and lift up our, again our, our AYS uh, plans this afternoon. I pray that you will bless it. And I pray our young people will be a part of it. We've got young people, Father, help them to see that this is a safe zone that they could come and relax and come and learn about you because they will be the soldiers that will lead out in your army, Holy Father. Thank you for hearing this prayer, Father. In the precious name of our Lord and our Savior, I do pray. Amen.